Hello, this is Miss Clark Reads to you, and I'm going to read the necklace to you by Guy de Maupassant, and just a little bit about him. He lived from 1850 to 1893, and the biography says, perhaps the best known short story writer in the world. Guy de Maupassant is known for his realistic stories that capture the surprising and sometimes unfortunate twists and turns of life. In the necklace, a middle-class woman dreams of becoming part of the social elite. Suddenly, it turns into a nightmare. Hmm. Maupassant was raised in northern France. As a young man, he served in the Franco-Prussian War, gathering experiences that would later appear in some of his stories. When the war ended, he took a job as a government clerk and devoted his spare time to writing. Maupassant became a literary apprentice of the well-known writer Gustave Flaubert, who introduced him to other illustrious writers of the day. Although Maupassant became quite well successful in Malfi. His later years were shadowed by ill health and depression. So the literary focus for this is the theme. Um, and one of the things that you may take note of is that this story will have an ironic ending. So Irony, situational irony, is the opposite to what we expect. So we're going to watch how the characters expect one thing and the opposite occurs. Now the way I will tackle this is I will read and teach and then probably make this into two videos. I will be addressing the elements, the literary elements, as we have done before. And I'll be making connections along the way. She was one of those pretty, charming young women who are born, as if by an era of fate, into a petty official's family. She had no dowry. A dowry is property that a woman brought to her husband at marriage. That was very traditional um, in this time period that, and even it happens today to some degree, um, in relationships in general, when you get married, you bring your property and then your pro it's dual owned after you get married, whether it's a, a house or land. In this case, a dowry in the 1800s may have been a significant amount of money, possessions, jewels, but she has nothing. She had no hopes, not the slightest chance of being appreciated, understood, loved, and married by a rich and distinguished man. That was, that's what she wanted. She wanted to marry someone rich. So she slipped into marriage with a minor civil servant at the Ministry of Education. So the word slipped is beautiful here because it shows that it, when you think about a slip, it's like a fall. Nobody really wants to fall. It's an accident. So that word is good. Like, okay, she accidentally met this man and she didn't really fall in love with him, but she decided to marry him because she didn't have hope of marrying someone rich. Unable to afford jewelry, she dressed simply, but she was as wretched as a day class A, which is a lowered in social status person. For women have neither caste nor breeding. In them, beauty, grace, and charm replace pride of birth. Innate refinement, instinctive elegance, and suppleness of wit give them their place on the only scale that counts. And these qualities make humble girls the peers of the grandest ladies. She suffered constantly, feeling that all the attributes of a gracious life, every luxury should rightly have been hers. The poverty of her rooms, the shabby walls, the worn furniture, the ugly upholstery caused her pain. So when she looks at her old couch and she looks at you know, her worn out walls that maybe the wallpaper needs to be painted. 
she feels depressed and it says it causes her pain like that physical pain that is heightened because you're so sad all these things that another woman of her class would not have even noticed tormented her and made her angry the very sight of the little breton girl who cleaned for her awoke rueful thoughts in the wildest dreams in her mind she dreamt of thick carpeted reception rooms with oriental hangings lighted by tall bronze torches and with two huge footmen in knee breeches made drowsy by the heat from the stove, asleep in the wide armchairs, she dreamt of great drawing rooms upholstered in old silks with fragile little tables holding priceless knickknacks, and of enchanted little sitting rooms redolent of perfume designed for tea time chats with intimate friends. Famous long after, famous sought after men whose attentions all women longed for. That's what she dreams of. She wants knickknacks, like, you know, little little things that you have about your house that are like just little tokens. Like on my shelf here, those are knickknacks. They're, they're, they're just a symbol of people giving you gifts or you have a little bit of extra money. She doesn't have knickknacks or tables holding knickknacks. And she wants tea time chats with intimate friends, maybe even some men there. Sought after men whose attentions all women longed for. Important men, politicians. In our case, we think of movie stars. She does have a maid though, if you pick that up. And when she looks at her little Breton girl who cleaned for her, she has these rueful thoughts meaning sorrow or regret she's like oh i don't want just one maid i wish i had four maids when she sat down to dinner at a round table with its three-day-old cloth and watched her husband opposite lift the lid of the soup tureen and exclaim delighted ah good homemade beef stew there's nothing better she would visualize elegant dinners with gleaming silver amid tapestry walls, people by nights, and ladies and exotic birds in a fairy forest. She would think of exquisite dishes served on gorgeous china and of gallantries whispered and received with sphinx-like smiles while eating the pink flesh of trout or wings of grouse. So she wants to eat pink flesh fish. You know, fish is expensive. It can be very pricey. Um, and all she has to offer her husband is this homemade beef stew, which he loves. He finds very delightful. Um, and they haven't changed the tablecloth in three days, the three day old cloth. Um, that's a, that's a good example to show how badly she wants to be wealthy. She'd like to have a new tablecloth every day. She had no proper wardrobe and no jewels, nothing. And those were the only things that she loved. She felt she was made for them. She would have so loved to charm, to be envied, to be admired and sought after. She loves jewels and clothes, but she doesn't have any extra money to buy those things. She had a rich friend, a schoolmate from the convent she had attended, but she didn't like to visit her friend because it always made her so miserable when she got home again and she would weep for whole days at a time from sorrow, regret and despair and distress. You know, she has a friend who has money and she does like to visit her friend, but then she goes home and she cries because she is reminded of the things that she doesn't have. Then one evening, her husband arrived home looking triumphant and waving a large envelope. There, he said, there's something for you. She tore it open eagerly and she took out a printed card which said, the Minister of Education and Madame Georges Rampagnol request the pleasure of the company of Madame and Monsieur Loisel at an evening reception at the ministry on Monday, January 18th. Instead of being delighted, her as her husband had hoped, she tossed the invitation on the table and she muttered annoyed, what do you expect me to do with that? Why, I thought you'd be pleased, dear. You never go out and this would be an occasion for you, a great one. You know, I had a lot of trouble getting it. Everyone wants an invitation. They're in great demand and there are only a few reserved for the employees. All the officials will be there. And she looked at him irritated and said impatiently, 
I haven't a thing to wear. How could I go? It had never even occurred to him, he stammered. But what about the dress you wear to the theater? I think it's lovely. He fell silent, amazed and bewildered to see that his wife was crying two big tears escaped from the corner of her eyes and rolled down toward the corner of her mouth and he mumbled, what is it? What is it, dear? But with great effort, she had overcome her misery and now she answered him calmly, wiping her tear damp cheeks. It's, it's not in your just I have no evening dress and so I cannot go to the party and give that invitation to one of your colleagues whose wife will be better dressed than I would be. He was overcome. Listen, Matilda, how much would an evening dress cost? A suitable one that, that you could wear. Maybe on other occasions, something very sim simple. So let's do a quick um, um, analyzation of what we've got here for the plot details. So we've got, um, just move. I have a couple boxes here. Excuse me. So I have. Uh, we have Madame Lo uh, Loisel, also known as uh, Matilda. We have her husband, Monsieur Loisel, and then we have. Um, you haven't met her yet, officially, Madame Forcier. This is uh, Madame Loisel and Matilda's best friend, the rich friend. We are in France. It is the early, uh, I would say mid, I would say the mid 1800s. Our main conflict right now is uh, Matilda. wants to be wealthy she wants all the things that go with wealth too all those possessions and she's upset because she has no proper wardrobe for the ball. Now the first rising action detail is uh, her husband asks, how much do you need to get a new dress? Okay, so this is a rising action. How much to get new dress? Okay, all right, so I'll read another paragraph or two, and then I'll stop the video, and then I will read um, the second part of the story. She thought for several seconds, making her calculations, and at the same time estimating how much she could ask for without elic eliciting an immediate refusal and an exclamation of horror from this economical government clerk. Hmm. At last, not too sure of herself, she said, you know, it's hard to say exactly, but I think I could manage with 400 francs. He went a little pale, for that was exactly the amount he had put aside to buy a rifle so he could go hunting the following summer near, near Nanterre with a few friends who went shooting larks around there on Sundays. However, he said, well, all right then. I'll give you 400 francs, but try to get something really nice. So this right here shows you how, how much her husband loves her. He's willing to give up the money he was saving to buy himself a, a, a gun, a rifle to go shooting, go hunting with friends, um, so that she can just buy a dress for one evening, one evening's ball. So we'll stop there and we'll come back and we'll look at the rest of the story. And I look forward to reading to you, and I hope you're doing really well. Thank you.